When I was 16, I was at our diocesan camp uh, during a spring retreat. This was on Thetis Island, and everything was going well until the very last night when the fire alarm system malfunctioned. Uh, the camp was nestled in the woods of Thetis Island, so a fire was potentially dangerous, not just to the camp itself, but to the entire island. So with this malfunction, protocol mandated uh, that several individuals needed to stay awake all night to keep vigil over the camp so that we could man the manual alarm um, if a fire broke out. I and another friend, we volunteered to do just that. And so everybody else went to sleep knowing that they were being watched over um, by vigilant and responsible 16-year-olds. It was fun. Today we heard a beautiful psalm, psalm number 121. If you don't know the psalm, then I would encourage you later on today, find your Bible uh, and sit and just read the psalm three, maybe four times. It won't take you any more than about five minutes, uh, but really try to get to know the psalm because it's, it's beautiful. It begins with this wonderful image of looking up to the mountains. I cast my eyes into the hills, it says. And we sometimes take the psalm as uh, this, wonderful, uh, this wonderful description of this grand mountains, the greatness of the mountains, peaks to which we ascend and to which we climb. But in reality, the psalm speaks about the one who is greater than the mountains, the one who is the maker of heaven and earth, but even better still, the one who keeps vigil over us. I invite you to turn your Bibles to Psalm number 121. Psalm begins with a question. I cast my eyes onto the hills, from where does my help come? So the psalm, you can imagine, is embedded right at the start in the stickiness of life. You can imagine the psalmist looking up toward the mountain, well, thereby it might declare that the psalmist is in a valley below. I look up to the mountains, from the depths to which I have sunk. And how will my help come all the way down here? From where does my help come from? This question is not just a question of minor inconvenience to which the psalmist is facing. It's not just a mere bump in the road. We ask that question when we, there is a sense that we are pushed to the limits. And people answer this question all sorts of ways, right? Where does my help come from? Well, some, we appeal to the greatness of ourselves. I lift my eyes unto the hills. From where does my help come from? Me, we say. And we have all sorts of slogans that keep us thinking that it's by the strength of our muscles or it's by the positivity of our minds that we will be able to overcome all of life's obstacles or all the hurdles that it throws at us. We tell ourselves, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Right? Adversity, well, that's where you show your muster. It's where you show what you're made of. It's where you prove that you are either G.I. Jane or G.I. Joe, and that nothing in this big bad world will ever overthrow you. Have you ever heard somebody say, tough times don't last, tough people do? What do you mean by that? What do you mean by tough? You mean six-packs, abs, and, and bulging biceps? You're talking about emotional toughness, having a hard shell where you are so unaffected by such wimpish notions like feelings or care. Is that what we're talking about? See, but the truth that we all know is that when there are no eyes upon us and we are left to ourselves, we know that we are not as tough as we sometimes try to make ourselves out to be. There is an uncomfortable truth that when we live in the palaces built by our own strength, that we are always fearful that one day that palace is just going to crumble and we will not know what we will do. I cast my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? If we don't look to ourselves, some look to others. Right? Israel did. After being liberated from Egypt, after being led into the promised land, they look around and they see all the other nations with their kings and their political allegiances and they think, 
Well, that's what we need. That's going to keep us secure. We just need to be like everybody else. And there's this interesting conversation that they have with the Lord. They say, God, give us a king. And God says, but I'm your king. And they say, no, not good enough. We want a king that we can see. We want to be like everybody else. Because if we're like everybody else, then no harm will ever come to us. And so they pleaded and they pleaded and they pleaded and eventually God gave them a king. And they entered into the world of politics and political maneuvering. But like an elastic which is pulled too tightly, everything snaps when our reliance upon others proves just a bit too much. And for Israel, everything came shattering down. Allies turned to enemies and they were eventually led into exile. See, when that happens... We either turn back to ourselves and say, well, obviously, you know, obviously I just need to be a little bit tougher. Obviously, I'm the only one that I can trust. I am the only one that will lead me through all the tough stuff of life. Or we look to something else, which is stuff. I cast my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? Well, there's an app for that. That's why some people can't throw things away. Because if you see your safety, if you see your inner peace, it's reliant upon the stuff that you hold, even if it's junk, then you just can't bear to part with it. But like a sound system that breaks at an inconvenient time, can we really trust the stuff that we buy to watch over us? Can we really expect that inanimate objects will keep vigil. See, all of these ways of managing our lives by relying upon the strength of ourselves or the alliances of others or relying upon the stuff that we have, all of it leads to an inner restlessness. They don't provide for that sense of inner peace by which our shoulders can drop and we feel like the weight of everything that we carry just falls away. Because the thing, because all of these things bring with it constant fear. What happens when I'm not tough enough? What happens if I'm not tough enough tomorrow? What happens if the deals that I have made, the people I have put my trust into, what happens if it proves ill-placed? What happens if all the stuff that I have piled around me to keep me walled in from life hurts? What happens if they don't work as well as I would like? Fear comes in. It begins to take over. Anxiety kind of digs deep and it settles and it roots itself within. Have you ever found yourself facing something in life, either a decision, a fight, a struggle, and it wears you out? You've gone through an entire day facing whatever it is that you've needed to face and you lie in bed finally to get some sleep because frankly you were exhausted only to find that whatever struggle has been part of the day is now invading your dreams and it's actually keeping you up you lie in bed and you just can't get rest because your mind is racing with scenarios and speeches and everything that you can't control or questions that you don't know how to answer have you ever experienced that I wonder if that's what drove Nicodemus to Jesus late at night. This is odd interaction we see in the gospel. This man comes to Jesus at night and says, why was he up? The implication is that this would have been in the early morning hours when everything was still dark. Nicodemus is up and he seeks Jesus out. And we don't know what question he comes with, but I think the implication is that he is deeply unsettled. Because you don't seek Jesus out in the middle of the night just to have some theological discussion. Nicodemus was burdened. Maybe he even felt lost. Jesus responds to him by saying, unless you are born again, unless you are born from above, you can't see the kingdom of God. When we find our ultimate help in life, Right? 
that solid basis of which we will just rest everything upon, when we find that in ourselves, in our own strength, or in our allies, or in our gadgets, this will only lead to fear, and it will lead to constant questioning. It will lead to inner restlessness. But it doesn't have to be that way. In those places where we feel overwhelmed, when we feel like a mouse standing before a mountain and the weight of the world is just bearing down upon us, we are asked to remember that we live in the presence of the one who is bigger than that mountain. I lift my eyes up to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and the earth. We are loved and we are cared for by the one who created everything in this life. And unlike all the stuff that we try to hold ourselves, God's eye upon us will not fade, his care will not wane, and he will not prove unfaithful. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Pay attention, which is what behold means. Pay attention. He who keeps watch over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Lord is never too tired to watch you or to watch over you. And it means that all our inner turmoils can cease. When we are exhausted, when we feel spent, when we feel emotionally frail or just stretched beyond our means, we can lay that all before the one who is big enough to hold it. And because he will not slumber or sleep, we can give everything to him and we can rest. And we can be at peace. St. Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. He is the comfort of our souls. Jesus says that we must be born from above. To be born from above is to be born from the Spirit. To allow the Holy Spirit to be the source and the power of our lives. He will not let your foot slip, the psalm says. Our foot won't slip because he is the very one upon which we will stand. God alone becomes our sure footing. There's this old hymn, On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand. To be born from above is to base our life upon the solid basis of Jesus' presence and to allow his spirit to provide the breath and the pulse of our life. To be born from above is not something that we do for ourselves. It's not something that we that we claim or that we earn. It is something that is gifted to us. It is something that is done to us and done for us. And it happens when we cast our lives upon the one who is bigger than all of the mountains. Ultimately, Psalm 121 is a psalm of trust and it's a psalm of confidence. It's an affirmation of the greatness of the one who watches us. The Lord will keep you from all evil. The Lord will keep your life. He will keep your going out. And he will keep your coming in from this time and forevermore. There is no part of our lives that is not touched by the love and the grace of God. And that means that every moment can be one in which we live with this inner settledness, this peace which transcends all understanding, this centeredness which withstands everything in life, because we walk through each moment in life grounded in the presence of our Savior. And to all sleepless Nicodemuses and valley-dwelling psalmists, and to all of us wherever we may fall, Jesus opens the doorway into that rest-filled, kingdom-aware life. The gospel ends with those famous words about believing in him. To believe in him means to cast your life upon him. Take all that you hold, and to take all that concerns you, and to give it over to him. It means to begin to see who you are, and to see your life, not as a reference to the mountains that you face, but to understand it in relation to the one who formed you, and the one who keeps you. And to understand that you are so cared for, you are so beloved, that God, every moment of your life, watches over you. You are so beloved that Jesus came to redeem you through the gift 
of his life on the cross and your soul can be at rest because your life is encased in the loving presence of the one who never sleeps but who longs to bless and keep you. Amen.